Greetings! I'm Roger Newbold, and welcome to episode number 44 of Experience Photography. Hey, I apologize for three weeks of illness and, and being late with issue, this issue. I'm back. I'll try my very best to get back on schedule. But uh, I just wanted you to know what happened. I didn't fall off the end of the earth. My fellow photographer and very good friend and partner, editor for this episode, is Mr. Matt Rich. He's the eyes that watch over the situation. He approves everything that goes on. He makes all of this vlog project totally operational. Are you there, my friend? Oh, my God, you got it again. Yeah, <laughs> excellent, good. In our uh, most recent past episode, we observed that gathering the seeds of inspiration and planting them and allowing them time to flourish for later use was a well-endorsed concept. We hope that the days allow you to gather in many ideas and be more fruitful in your work. During my exploration for today's vlog, I read a really interesting article concerning black and white photography. It stated, if you research old photography masters, such as Ansel Adams, you'll notice that they photographed in black and white. <laughs> wow! I, I didn't know whether to take that as an upgrade to Ansel Adams or an insult. I, I wasn't sure. I have such intense memories of sitting side by side with Ansel and reviewing prints in his dining room. I, I wasn't sure if I was officially now old or because my enduring admiration of black and white. During one of our local photo meetings, one of our members, Howard, added some good ideas and as we were discussing all of this and uh, I thought I'd follow on with some of those and then I discussed this with Matt quite thoroughly and he helped me clarify these thoughts. I thank them both for today's stimulus in the, di the direction we're going to take today. So today we're going to contemplate that there might be more than one way to generate an outstanding photograph. Hopefully, we will discover something about, you know, the concealing quality of maybe too much color and remaining open-minded about our choices and thinking about how to create more expressive images. Let's, let's jump into some technical color thoughts right here. I, I need to take a look-see into color imaging first. The three color method, which is the foundation of most practical color processes, whether chemical or electronic, they were first suggested in 1855 in a paper on color vision by the Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell. The development of color-based materials trailed the 1839 introduction of black and white materials only by 16 years. It was, it was never a matter of one material being better or worse. It was a matter of simplicity. It was easier to first harness a colorless, light-dark image when photography in general was you know, only a half-baked fantasy. We are grateful now that we have the ability to express our desires in either color or black and white. The shortcomings in color imaging has been due to A, the impermanence of color dyes, and B, the disagreement of all parties involved involved as to what true color should really look like. 
Let's look at point A. Color permanence has finally reached a stage of what they call an acceptable fade rate. Kodak was still warning professional photographers that color images would drastically fade well into the 1980s. You know, I always pass that information to all my clients. So, <laughs> I'm sorry if your precious wedding album pictures disappeared. Sorry. I have to blame Kodak. We're pointing fingers in every direction. Are you fading away? In 1938, when the ultra-stable uh, color Kodachrome sheet film first became available, many thought the permanence problem was solved. Well, not so. And here's why. The more straightforwardly printable color negative film soon became the torchbearer, and it had more transient color problems. Instantly, <laughs> there was established a new poster board for color permanence, or impermanence as it is. Subsequently, in 1999, <clears throat> somebody poked a bear, and it got him with a big stick, and digital imaging sprang onto the scene in one fierce giant bound. To contend with the unstable colors, Kodak, Epson, and Fujifilm, and many others, have poured a ton of money into color permanence research. <coughs> I suppose their combined conclusion that a hundred year life of color is acceptable to most. Well, in another hundred years, I won't be the one complaining. Point B, color fidelity and conformability. Well, sorry, that's still up for grabs. While I was living in England and photographing using USA-made Kodachrome and then used UK-manufactured Kodachrome, and I noticed a distinct color difference. The UK Kodachrome included more reddish bias in the film, I believe to counteract the constantly grayer skies. Some were just never satisfied. Soon we were offered a choice of Kodachrome or Ektachrome. But, you know, they've always been entirely different in the nature of their color cast. And then Fuji Velvia and Provedia later rang in with a film with new color renditions. No one had ever experienced anything like Velvia, but it sure got an immediate acceptance. Now, digitally, we face relentless nagging from DxO Color Labs and other organizations, proclaiming them as the great arbiter of who has the best color in a digital sensor. You know, is it Canon, or Nikon, or Sony, or Fuji? I don't even know who anointed them. But I know I've made my choice. And the important thing here is not to be bound by opinions and choices of others. Take charge of your own c color. You know, as for point B, I'm having to say that Photoshop might be your personal liberator. You can be large and in charge. You can make the color however you please. Post-production considerations. Yeah, this is an abrupt change of thought, and it must be added at this point. Why post before anything else? Well, indeed, you want to start out with an inappropriate manner of data capture? Well, if you do, who's going to save you later? And what are they going to save you with? And 
Would you like to provide others with the maximum potential if we can? Well, photographing in the JPEG format has two major benefits. <laughs> First, the camera operator does not have to think. The camera manufacturer has forcefully interjected their opinions as to what good image should be and be like. They have set what they believe is the best for your work. Well, you just got taken advantage of, and you didn't even get a free dinner out of it. Color, contrast, sharpness, many other important decisions were swept from the plate before you even got to select your entree. They're so kind. No, they don't know me. They don't know my work, my location, nor my client's need. They don't know whether I'm digitally transmitting or printing images. But you have their assurance. They're correct. Secondly, they conveniently clip the file to a neutered 8-bit size and tossed out, yeah, tossed out all of the unused digital data permanently. You don't have to worry about those nasty large files anymore. They're gone. Yeah, they're way small. 8-bit image only provides 256 tones per pixel maximum, whereas the raw 24-bit, that's RGB, three color channels, uh, can provide up to 16 million seven hundred and some thousand tone pixels. Inspect the difference. Here's a chart. 8-bit versus 24-bit rendition. Now, my personal Canon 5D S camera produces about a 60 megabyte, megabyte file when it's in RAW, but only about a 10 to 15 megabit file in JPEG. Now, file size will vary with the amount of subject detail, but th this is close to average. So, I want you to explain to me, why would I purchase a dream camera with 50 megapixels and throw four-fifths of them in the bin. For maximum potential and possibilities, I want 50 megapixels, not 10 or 15. Most don't realize what a disservice they have intentionally foisted upon themselves by selecting JPEG. Now, I'm saying that larger file sizes in RAW format always provides maximum potential for image exploration, image management, and or rescue. So large files reg uh, really rule. Now, let's look at this. If you don't want to pay for larger capture cards or more cards, and if you don't want to take advantage of post-production capabilities, you best take a moment right here and think this out completely. What is your personal needs or desires? I can't decide that for you. You're the only one who can decide what you want. And whatever you choose is okay as long as you're aware of the consequences. Now, let's look at some aesthetic considerations. We use whatever tools are available to us to generate an image and tell a visual story to an audience. Trying to decide which contrivances are most effective in that effort of telling is the art end of photography. And thanks to one of our loyal subscribers, Howard Johansson, we look at his picture of the Hotel Rex. So let's examine some options here with this picture. 
Here we witness a finely crafted image that portrays a nice bluebird kind of day. The bounced light reflecting in on the facade adds a dimensional texture that adds a lot of character. The leading lines from the bottom aid in directing our gaze to the sign, so it gives us some clarity of information. Well, the blueness of the sky does not really add to the image other than it supports the blue tone in the sign. Now, that's a meager amount of blue, and it's not binding on the image or its quality of this particular picture. Often, I fear, we wave the color banner only because that's what our camera shoots. Let's look at the second interpretation of this image. Howard increased the power of the image by removing unnecessary color. He magnified the intensity of the statement. Now the viewer no longer is in limbo. What am I supposed to look at? What am I supposed to consider? It no longer disguises the image's potential. By carefully managing a large high bit raw color f file, you know, he had ample existing data available to generate an excellent more impactful image. Now, we've always found it better to convert to monochrome or black and white and modify in post-production rather than click the camera and convert to monochrome in camera. A raw color image contains all three channels, 8 bits each, thus 24-bit image. A monochrome in-camera file usually is de dealing with a lower 8-bit image. One reason people resist change and creative wonderment is that they focus on what they'd have to give up. Oh, I have to give up color. What? Uh, they don't consider what they have to gain. Consider this thoughtfully. Here's the Grove Market. It's Howard's second image. It features a picture that all of us would be proud to have taken. The color's rich, vibrant, displays the sign, uh, worthy of attention. However, the color in the lower third of the image is coloriferous. It weakens the power of the sign. It demands equal billing. Now, in the adapted second version, Howard again removed the element of color, thus it added potential to the sign. Secondly, it removed the competition of the foliage and the awning in the statement. From time to time, color can be a hindrance. It camouflages some of the other obstacles. Third, Howard used a replace sky technique for bold intensity. Now, now, by all means, shoot in color. Realize how it affects the picture in every single sense. You know, color's easier removed, if necessary, than added. Yeah, do your conversions in post-production. The software, and it can retain maximum data for its content. Don't, don't switch in camera. Now, don't be afraid to reconsider your decision if you have that opportunity. Look at the picture, make a decision. Is it better to walk alone or walk with a big crowd just to be popular? Now, in this pair of images, I photographed down into a discarded water bottle. The left image is the found concept, its original color. The right side was converted to black and white, later to abolish the dingy color. It was cropped for better composition and then gently recolored for effect in 24-bit color. Yeah, it makes a big, huge difference. 
Now, in this image pair, it reflects that when I shot it, color didn't add the impact that I was hoping for. At the moment of exposure, it just it seemed weak. But when I converted later to black and white, it seemed to look better. Now, it seems to shout, fracture! Yep. So let's look at today's discoveries. Black and white images are not in competition with color. One process is not better than the other. They're, they're simply different. Monochrome and color are both important and they are both welcome as needed. For, <laughs> sorry to tell you this, JPEG files do not have all the puzzle pieces in the box. Five, you can always reimagine, reinnovate, remodel, and restore a 24-bit image if you save that raw. They are important. All right. Like the candy bar ad states, sometimes you feel like one and sometimes you feel like the other. Here's a picture. Today, Zion's Canyon felt soft, pastel, beautiful in color. Today, Zion Canyon felt like majestic patriarchs of a past era. You know, it's always good to have freedom of choice. Consider this. If there's one thought doesn't work, it doesn't work out as well as you'd like, change the thought, but not the goal. I remember a sobering thought that Sam Abel shared with me one day when we were photographing in Santa Fe, New Mexico, USA. I commented how easy he made the process appear to be. He said, it matters little how much equipment we use, but it matters much that we master all of the equipment that we do use. Well, my journey is not yours. Nevertheless, if we ever meet on the path of life, may we be kind enough to encourage each other along. My friends, our time's up today. It's been my pleasure to spend some time with you. We have been, if you've enjoyed today's episode on More Than One Right Answer, why not share it with somebody new? Provide them a new innovative opportunity. And if you appreciate today's episode, hey, give us a big thumbs up, ring that bell, tinkle it, whoa, subscribe. Sudden revelations and insights quietly appear all through life. So which is more important, the journey or the destination? I say the company you have along the way is the most important. And I thank you for your company today. And as we say, the tip of my hat to you, my friends. Until we meet again on screen, cheerio and thank you.